Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to Shankaraya's Academy's uh, series of uh, discussions on various previous year questions. We have divided into various subjects. You've already seen on YouTube uh, videos that have been uploaded on other subjects. So this is a continuation of that. So today we'll be discussing uh, core economics. The subject of economics itself, we are dividing it into two. One, purely based on the concepts that are associated with economics, there are eight areas into which we'll segregate core economics and we'll be discussing those. Subsequently, there will also be another video on the general side of economics, which is how the Indian economy, Indian economics, how Indian economy has progressed over the years and questions that are based on that area that will be discussed separately. All right. So today uh, in our session, we'll be dealing with questions from 2016 to 2022. So that's a period of uh, seven years that we'll be discussing. So uh, these, there are a total of 87 questions that we'll be discussing as well. Um, so there is already an, a video in existence on YouTube, which talks about various techniques in order to arrive at specific answers, even if you don't quite know the entire area that is being questioned in. Today's focus would be slightly different. So I've taken almost all the questions in during this period of uh, years that we have mentioned over here. Almost all the questions are there. So there's, as I told you, a total of 87 questions. So the focus is on understanding the answer to all of those questions, specifically the concept oriented one. Wherever we can arrive at an answer through elimination techniques, I'll mention those as well. All right. We'll start with, we'll start with the topic of money. Money inflation banking is one set. Okay. So we'll have to look at it together one after the other money less number of questions inflation slightly more number of questions and ultimately banking has a lot of questions especially from the period 2016 to 2019 a lot of questions from the area okay so we'll start with money consider the following statements um the governor of reserve bank of india is appointed by the central government it's factual it's basic knowledge it is especially if you have been following the uh, issues that was there when uh, Urjit Patel was the uh, governor and subsequently uh, the current governor came into, uh, was appointed by the government again. So that's something that you would know. Okay, the governor is appointed by the central government. Certain provisions of the constitution of India give the central government the right to issue directions to the RBI in public interest. On the face of it, it seems like a correct statement. However, the error here is Constitution of India doesn't give those provisions. Certain provisions in the RBI Act give the central government the right to issue directions to RBI in public interest. So the relationship between RBI and the central government is not given by the Constitution of India. It is given by the RBI Act, by an act of the parliament that it is there. So that is what makes it wrong. Many people miss this particular uh, part of the question that it is not the constitution, it is the RB Act. Second statement is wrong. If you know second statement is wrong, only one answer is left. One and three. Governor of RBA draws his power from the RBA Act. And even if you didn't focus on the word constitution of India, the moment you see RBA Act, it should awaken you. You'll say, okay, fine. We have to focus on where the power is coming from. RBA Act. So look at the previous statement again. There it said constitution. That Alertness should always be there. When you read the second statement to begin with, you might not focus on Constitution of India. But when the third statement says that the power is drawn from the RB Act, that should be a matter that should awaken you to that point in the second statement. The answer is 12, uh, sorry, 27C. Okay. Moving to 28. The money multiplier in an economy increases with which one of the following? Uh, increase in CRR, more money is kept with the bank itself, less money given out as loan, money multiplier tends to go down. When does money multiplier increase? When does money multiply to a greater extent? As more loans are given, money multiplies to a greater extent. CRR increases, SLR increases, money all available to give loans goes down. So A and B are not part of the answer, are not the answer. Increase in ba banking habits of the people, increase in population of the country. Population increasing may or may not have an impact on it because what matters is not how many people are there. What matters is how many people are using the banking system. C is the answer over here. This answer, everyone in the year 2021, everyone should have answered this question because this exact question is given without a change in the options. 
the exact question is given in a couple of couple of years 2019 they have asked this question we will see as we go on okay so the answer here is c 28 c 29 if you withdraw 1 lakh in cash 1 lakh rupees in cash from your demand deposit account at your bank the immediate effect on aggregate money supply in the economy will be now aggregate money supply this is a question on monetary aggregates application level question on the face of it it is a tough question to answer but if you are someone who knows the concept of monetary aggregates this question becomes easier for you to answer so there is m0 but m0 is not aggregate money supply we have m1 m2 and m3 m3 is what is referred to as aggregate money supply okay total money supply in the economy which should ideally be equal to the gdp of the country m0 is the total printed currency in the economy okay so question is question is not about m0 what is the classification of m1 m2 and m3 m1 refers to money which is either which is in the country but which is not accessible for a bank bank cannot use it for lending purposes which means m1 doesn't contribute much towards multiplication at all what is inside m1 cash in the hands of public cash in the hands of rbi money which comes into the bank but the bank cannot use it in the form of demand deposits that is what is in m1 m2 means slightly more liquidity for the banks from the banks perspective so this is again an area which confuses a lot of people upsc has in the long uh, a long while ago has asked a question uh, m1 m2 m3 uh, which is more liquid they it's a very ambiguous question and the answer was uh, m1 is more liquid because people have access to it okay but again i have a bit of an issue with that understanding because liquidity is a matter of perspective if you deposit uh 1 lakh rupees in a bank as demand deposit it is liquid money for you but it is not liquid from for a bank because bank cannot use it to give out loans because you might come and ask for it any time so liquidity depends on who are you talking about so from the public's perspective deposit in a demand deposit is a liquid money liquid money whereas from the bank's perspective the demand deposit is not liquid money term deposit becomes liquid money for them so look at it from the bank's perspective m1 is money which is not liquid for them because they cannot give out loan m2 is more liquid m1 plus more liquid money and m3 is m2 plus more liquid money which is easily accessible money that's how we classify it. so here the question is if you withdraw rupees 1 lakh in cash from your demand deposit account demand deposit account is a part of m1 so demand deposit account is a part of m1 and uh, withdraw cash withdraw in the form of cash so which means what you're taking this money and you're keeping it as cash in the hands of public so what we are noticing is noticing is that from one heading inside m1 we are taking the money and keeping it another heading inside m1 when does money overall money supply change if you take money from m3 and put it inside m2 or m2 is put inside m1 or fresh money is created and it goes into m1 or m2 or m3 let's say there is 1 lakh rupees over here okay which the bank has given out as loan or you have gone and taken that money and deposited it somewhere else so the money would be in multiple places so there could be a chance of increase in multiplication okay or if the bank is going and depositing this money in the hands of rbi money itself is taken out of circulation then there could be a possibility of decrease here it is just change of heading within the same category which means the end result is it leaves the money overall money unchanged okay from m1 one category of m1 to another category of m1 which is not going to affect the overall calculation at all so the end result is that there will be no change in the overall money supply in the economy it looks like a very complicated question but if you are someone who understands the concept of monetary aggregates and money multiplication you would know that taking the money from uh, say keeping it as cash or putting it in the bank in the form of demand deposits which you can access through card there is no difference at all in the overall money supply in the economy so it is a higher level of question where you have to apply the knowledge that you have repeat of the question that i was talking about earlier money multiplier in an economy increases which one of the following increase in crr increase in slr increase in population increase in ba banking habits of the population they have just changed the order b has become c c has become b answer in this case is b there is no doubt about it if you have prepared for the exam in 2021 you should obviously have looked at previous year questions and known the answers to that which means the earlier question there is no way you should have missed it because the upsc itself has given you the answer to that question already repeat question so 30b 31 which of the following uh, which one of the following statements currently describes the meaning of legal tender money 
so again we have to understand the concept over here it's a concept based uh, it's a knowledge question simply know the definition of legal tender you will be able to answer conventionally legal tender is understood as legally accepted form of payment which means legally you can use this to make payment but if you look at that then check will also be legally accepted check is also legally accepted it's not illegal okay what makes legal tender unique is that the government has passed an order in such a way that not only can you legally use it for payment the one who is receiving it cannot say no to it there is a compulsion on the part of the receiver to accept the money if it is legal tender if it has legal tender status you pay a certain money you you owe some owe someone uh, uh, say 1000 uh, rupees you give them 1000 rupee note they can say no to it because 1000 rupee note doesn't have legal tender status india doesn't have a 1000 rupee note at the moment so 1000 rupee note is legal, not legal tender you give a check they may say no to it you pay using card they may say no to it but if you pay in cash in 2 500 rupee notes they have to accept it because it's legal tender money the money which a creditor is under compulsion to accept in settlement of his claims b is the answer over here okay everything else there are say money in defray uh, legal fees that is not legal tender that is just to confuse you with the word legal the bank money in the form of checks drafts there is no compulsion to accept it it is not it's legal but it's not legal tender it is not by definition what is called as legal tender there is nothing illegal about it but bank money gets its validity from the bank not from the government and d the metallic money in circulation in the country metallic money may be legal tender but that is not what is the definition of legal tender so b is the most appropriate answer in this case d is also legal tender but that is not the correct description of what is legal tender okay it is not that only metallic money is legal tender so d cannot be the answer b has to be the answer okay so 31 b 32 the last question inside uh, uh, money with reference to bitcoins sometimes seen in the news which of the following statements is or are correct bitcoins are tracked by the central banks of the countries they are not given simply cryptocurrency in 2016 the question is about specifically about bitcoins they are tracked by the central banks if you knew anything about cryptocurrencies at that point of time or if you know anything about it now also the whole advantage which cryptocurrency provides or bitcoins provide which other currencies legal tender money or fiat money doesn't not fiat, uh, legal tender fiat money which fiat money doesn't provide is that fiat money is entirely controlled by the central bank they are tracked every single transaction can be traced okay as long as it happens digitally but bitcoins cannot be traced because there is no centralized authority there is no issuing authority it is based on a computer program that the coins are generated mining are through uh, solving of puzzles is how it is done so the management of the entire system is done by the people who are using it it's almost like the gold system that we were using in the past where did gold get its value from you know there eventually there came a certain situation where currency had the you know punch mark of the ruling authority and all those things but originally where did gold get its value from people themselves started accepting that okay we find this to be valuable we find this to be attractive we'll use this as a medium of transaction bitcoin is a situation like that and gold you can mine the more you get the more gold that is available as currency similarly bitcoins you mine it the more you get the more that is available there is an end to how much of gold is available physically there is an end to how much of bitcoin is available there are already it's been programmed in such a way that a limited number of bitcoins is there it will come to an end in the end okay so it is not tracked by central banks is one of the advantages which makes people go for bitcoins because their transaction can be uh, are not interfered with by the government or by any uh, authority okay so one is definitely wrong so if one is wrong you immediately remove the answers two and uh, two and three or three only which means you don't have to worry about three okay so whether you know online payments can be sent without either side knowing the identity of the other or not doesn't matter it can be sent that's another thing so three is definitely part of the answer because the only options left both have three in it the question is about second anyone with a bitcoin address can send and receive bitcoins from anyone else with a bitcoin address they can because there is no no one uh, controlling these transactions among the two people they can send and receive okay no restrictions there because there is no one to restrict so the answer is d two and three only so that is with respect to money we are done with the chapter of money we we'll go for inflation so uh, more number of questions here uh, from not wrong about 12 or 13 questions over here with reference to the indian economy what are the advantages of inflation index bonds 
very recent question governments can reduce the coupon rates on its borrowing by way of inflation index bonds coupon rates are the interest rate that is offered okay now how do inflation index bonds uh, work it's different from the conventional concept of inflation adjustment so previously the government used to uh, had issued one in the past the concept of inflation adjustment what they did is they would keep the principal to be fixed and they'll say the say let's say i lend 1000 rupees to the government the government says i'll give you 4 percentage plus inflation whatever is the rate of inflation or for inflation adjustment a certain value or they'll say 2 percentage plus whatever is the inflation rate so they'll give us that so the interest rate used to get adjusted according to uh, inflation in the economy okay but that is not the concept which government follows with respect to inflation index bonds at the present in present so what they do is they won't adjust the uh, interest rates at all the interest rate is fixed okay it will be a comparatively smaller rate let's say something like 4 percentage that is a fixed rate that won't change at all what will change is periodically they'll keep changing the value of the principal they'll do an inflation adjustment of the principal you gave 1000 rupees let's say last year you gave this year what is the value of 1000 rupees so is 1000 rupees has the purchase so if 1000 rupees is equal to 1000 let's say 1050 rupees this year assume that okay so uh, whatever you you could buy for 1000 rupees last year you need 1050 rupees to buy so there is an inflation adjustment done for the principal amount whereas the interest will remain the same so one principal is protected from inflation second because the interest is provided on top of the new sum inflation the interest will not be on uh, say for four percentage will not be on 1000 rupees in the second year if the principal is readjusted to 1050 the interest will be on 1050 not on 1000 which means while the interest rate will remain the same, the calculation of the interest is on the new principal, not the old principal. And finally, when you withdraw the money, the principal will be adjusted for inflation periodically and you will get a bigger sum, both in terms of principal and every year when you get the interest or every six months when you get the interest, the interest would also be calculated on a higher principal. So interest is also protected from inflation. So that is how it works. Government can reduce the coupon rates. Yes, because it provides the inflation protection, the government can reduce the coupon rate. Coupon rate is nothing but the interest rate. The government can reduce the interest rate. Usually, if the government have to give, let's say, 6% as a return, because you say, what if there is inflation? It's a fixed rate of interest. Here, the government is saying, we are adjusting the principal according to inflation, so we'll offer only 4%. That is a, see, government is providing us protection from inflation. What is the gain that they have? They have gain in, for, in the form of uh, a fixed uh, coupon rate, which would be lower than what would be the uh, coupon rate otherwise. So the first statement is correct over here. IABs provide protection to investors from uncertainty regarding inflation, which is true. The name itself says inflation index bonds. See, if you know anything else or not, your second statement, you have to, you have to know. Logic says inflation indexed bonds provides protection from inflation. Correct, right? So how can you consider that to be wrong? If you cannot if you know that two is definitely correct, so you eliminate this option. Then the last one, interest received as well as capital gains on IABs are not taxable. See, if they had at least said interest gained is not taxable, maybe there is some logic to it. But why should tax gains be provided? Is it like a social security measure to provide tax gains on this? No. Inflation adjustment is to help the one who's lending the money. Already that is the assistance that is providing. Why should the government provide any kind of tax rebate on this? So there is no tax rebate either on interest or capital gains. So three is wrong. So if three is wrong, your options only one left is A. One and two only is correct. So if you can make a bit of a guess about the third one, let's say you don't know one, even then you can make a guess about the third one saying that tax benefits for inflation index bonds, which is not a social welfare measure or anything like that, doesn't make any sense. Okay. You, if the question had been, is there a tax benefit on uh, small savings or pro say uh, for infrastructure uh, investment funds, then it makes sense to assume that, okay, there may be some tax benefit here. There is nothing like that. So three, you can rule out based on some logic. One and two remains the answer. But always remember when you make such guesses, sometimes your guess can go wrong. Probability will work out over here. Some cases your guesses will work. Some cases your guesses will go wrong. You can only hope that you are guessing more correct than you are guessing wrong. So always rely on knowing the answer, but there is always an next best option, which is logically guessing. In this case, you can apply logic. 
If you are thinking of the right logic at the right time, it will work to your advantage. So, 33, the answer is A. 34. In India, which one of the following is responsible for maintaining price stability by controlling inflation? The function, objectives of RBI itself is to maintain price stability. 2016 onwards, controlling inflation has become their primary responsibility as well through the Monetary Policy Committee. Reserve Bank of India is the answer. No guessing about this. It should be known. 34, D. 35. Which among the following steps is most likely to be taken at the time of an economic recession? Economic recession means what? No production. Production is not happening to a desired extent. So the government has to find a way to boost production, increase income in the hands of the people. So cut in tax rates, it, it is a logical step to do. Right? Accompanied by increase in interest rate. Increase in interest rate means what? Borrowing becomes costlier. People will not produce. So one part of it is correct. Second part of it is wrong. Increase in expenditure on public projects seems like a correct answer, but we'll come back to it. Increase in tax rates doesn't make any sense at all, right? Accompanied by reduction in interest rate. This part is correct. This part is wrong. So this is wrong. Reduction of expenditure on public projects. Why? Do we have high inflation? No. Our intention itself is to make more and more production happen. So reduction in expenditure doesn't make sense. So the ultimate answer is increase in expenditure on public projects with the expectation that first of all, it will provide income into the hands of people who are working over there. Second, it could bring about crowding in effect. Government spends public uh, on public projects. It may invite others to come into investment. So expectation is crowding in effect. Okay. All right. So the answer here is 35B. Moving to 36. Consider the following statements. Other things remaining unchanged. Market demand for a good might increase if logic is law of demand not part of our general understanding of our general topics that we learn in economics, but just like the opportunity cost question, this is a technical kind of question, but this is more, this is on the lines of something that you should be able to answer based on common knowledge. Everything else remaining changed, unchanged. So in economics, what do they mean by other things remaining unchanged? The demand of a commodity can be affected by many things. Income of a person can uh, be a factor. Tastes and preferences of a people can uh, be a factor. So all those things are remaining unchanged. So other things means what? Other than 1, 2, 3, 4 that they have given over here. Other than 1, 2, 3, 4, nothing else is changing. That is how you have to understand. So forget about other things. Just focus on 1, 2, 3, 4. You don't have to make assumptions of what will happen if something else happens beyond these four. That's not necessary is what the question itself says. Other things remaining unchanged. Market demand for a good might increase if 1. Price of its substitute increases. So you know what is the concept of substitute, right? So I have a pen in hand, I have a pencil in hand. So if not a pen, I could probably use a pencil. They're not perfectly substitutable, but I can, it does the same work. Both are used to write. So if not a pen, I could use a pencil. Okay. So if the price of pencil rises, I'm more likely to buy a pen. Because why would I buy that which is costly? So the price of a substitute increases. I might, those who are using pencil will now start using probably pen because pencil is becoming more expensive than what they want. Okay, so price of a substitute increases, it can increase the demand of this particular commodity, which is under consideration. Okay, so first one is definitely part of the answer. So we can eliminate B. Second, price of its complement. Now, substitute and complement are again economic terms. Substitute means one instead of other. Complement means you cannot use one without the other. For example, you buy a car, you buy fuel. Fuel is a complement for it. And maybe for some people, let's say uh, milk and sugar. So you consume milk. Some people might say I consume milk without sugar, but generally, so uh, milk and sugar, sugar can be considered as a complement. Okay. So all of these are what we call as complement or in, uh, maybe a better thing, pen and ink. If ink is becoming very expensive, you cannot use a pen. So when ink is becoming expensive, the demand for pen itself will drop. Okay, so price of a complement increases, the demand for the commodity will go down because you cannot use this commodity without that, and that is becoming very expensive. So, two is not part of the answer. Price of complement increases, the demand will go down. So, two cannot be answered. So, two is removed from here. So, we don't have to worry about four, and four is known. If the price of a commodity falls, the demand will increase. Someone gives a discount, we'll, we might end up buying things which we don't even want. So, four is definitely a part of the answer. The only question is, is three a part of the answer or not? Okay, the good is an inferior good and income of the consumer increases. So in this case, they are saying income is increasing, but the commodity is an inferior good. 
what is the example of an inferior good now i don't want to offend anyone who uses any commodity over here but let us say uh, you have very low income so you rely on uh, the rice that is available from um, so uh, ration stores okay but your income increases you consider if you consider the ration rice to be of a lower quality you would say when my income is increasing why should i buy that i'll go and buy something else so the something else is what is the commodity that we are talking about so the the particular good that we are talking about is an inferior good my income increases i will not buy the uh, inferior good over here okay so the ration rice is the commodity that we are talking about we'll buy less of it if the income increases or let's say we were previously consuming kerosene now we have um, lpg now because we have more income we can afford lpg as a result i might not go for kerosene i might replace it with a higher value item even if my income increases rather than buying more of kerosene i might buy less of kerosene so the good is an inferior good means i don't want it anymore i was consuming it because i didn't have a choice now i have more income i won't consume it so the demand will go down so 3 is not part of the answer the answer is a sorry the answer is a 1 and 4 only 37 which of the following is likely to be the most inflationary in its effects when will inflation go up simple answer is when money supply increases that is one of the factors which can cause inflation all of these are examples where money supply is going up repayment of public debt money supply goes up borrowing from public to finance budget deficit money supply is ultimately going up because to some extent borrowing from banks to finance public deficit uh, sorry budget deficit these two you will find a commonality there is money already in existence in the hands of public there is money already in existence in the hands of banks so already existing money is taken and given back so overall impact on money supply may be very less maybe a slight level of multiplication may happen but beyond that the scope is very less because existing money is used for re coming reintroduced into the economy a repayment of public debt itself means what already you had the money you wanted the money so your money was taken your money was given back so its impact on money supply in the economy is very less if at all there is any but creation of new money to finance budget deficit means what you are creating new money using which you are introducing or you are paying for a deficit that you have usually new money should be created for creating goods and services for buying creation of goods and services manufacture of goods and services here budget deficit is what is being financed it may not result in production of goods and services which means extra money same set of goods and services inflation is likely to happen all four can be considered as inflationary but which is likely to be the most inflationary in its effect creation of new money d is the most inflationary okay so 37 d also there is something else that you can uh, think of here you can say b and c cannot be one cannot be the answer while the other is not so you say b is the answer obviously equation why not c c is the answer why not b that rules it out repayment of public debt is one creation of new money you will have to make a choice if you apply a little bit of your knowledge of money supply and all those things you would know that d is the answer so that is 37 38 with reference to indian economy demand pull inflation can be caused or increased by which of the following demand pull inflation means money supply increases so in under which of the following can money supply increase that is how the question has to be reinterpreted okay demand pull means money supply is causing increase in uh, prices expansionary policy money supply increases fiscal stimulus money supply increases inflation index to wages there is inflation happening accordingly wages increased so no excess wage is given only inflation index wages are given that is not demand pull in nature when more than inflation in, in uh, income more than inflation is provided that can cause demand pull inflation but not inflation indexing of wages higher purchasing power means more income in the hands of people higher purchasing power is there so keep that in mind higher purchasing power is provided by higher income okay more than see i have 1000 rupees i can buy 1000 rupees worth of goods and services i have 1500 rupees i can buy worth 1500 but if enough goods and services are not there i might end up buying the same commodities at 1500 so it can cause inflation by giving more demanding power rising interest rates will make you borrow less money so it is not part of the answer so 1 2 and 4 is the answer a is the answer okay so always try to simplify the question demand pull inflation means what increase in money supply causing inflation so which of the following measures can increase inflation uh, can increase money supply in the economy that's how you have to look at it. okay moving to 39 
if the rbi decides to adopt an expansionist monetary policy money supply increases it decides to increase the money supply what would it not do cut and optimize slr slr goes down less money needs to be kept with the bank more money will go outside so that is a measure that it would do so one cannot be a part of the answer what would it not do okay it would not cut the slr which means that cutting slr is not part of the answer you have already arrived at the answer only one possible answer two only but the trick here is in this confusing aspect if you want to increase the money supply they will not asking what would you do they are asking what would you not do so how does our mind work we read that question we say okay so expansion monetary policy what did it not do we are read, ready with it cut and optimize slr cut and optimize money supply uh, slr okay money supply will increase we will think okay correct so one is correct one will be an expansion policy not do is something that we tend to miss out on so the challenge is unlike the usual what is not the correct answer this not do question is a higher level of complexity while sitting in the exam hall and answering because you read it you say okay expansions this is what should be done but what should not be done means the opposite is what they are asking for that is the trick over here increase in msf will mean less money will go out it is a not an expansion it's a contractionary policy cut in bank and repo rate so these two will not be there most likely people who make a mistake would end up marking 1 and 3 as the answer because of this challenge that is there the answer is two only 39 b is the correct answer okay so d is the correct answer 40 which of the following factors or policies were affecting the price of rice in india in the recent past so what determines or what affects the rise of price msp determines the or affects the price of rice because the government helps in determining what price it is being sold at government's trading government itself involved government stockpiling subsidies given to consumers can you rule out any of these as factors which affect the price of rice all of this have a role in determining the price of any commodity for that matter not just rice rice is just a word that they have given here because these four are applicable in the case of rice but all four here are factors which influence the price of any commodity so d is the answer over here moving on to 41 consider the following statements the weightage of food in cpi is higher than in wpi now it might look like a factual thing but there is a little bit of guessing work that you can do over here we are talking about a price index right two separate baskets of goods and services in the case of wholesale price index is only goods okay two separate baskets in which basket do you think there will be a higher priority for food item logically people consume food that becomes a greater role in fact if you know a little bit of fact you know that wholesale price index is the bigger dominant entity inside uh, sorry uh, manufacturing item is the dominant component inside wholesale price index but the question is not about which is the highest the question is the weightage of food is higher in which of the two factually food constitutes around 40 percentage in cpi whereas primary articles constitute about 22 percentage or something in wpi somewhere close to that right so that's factually even logically you can say consumer price index food will have a play, greater role to play because people spend more money on food so that is a greater weightage so by that logic first statement is correct wba does not capture change in price of services cpa does factual thing if you know it you can answer if not you can't guess rb has now adopted wpa as its key uh, measure of inflation and to decide on changing the key policy rates this was true till 2015 2016 onwards with the introduction of monetary policy committee with an all india consumer price index called as cpi combined we have moved from wpa to cpi third statement is wrong third statement is wrong leaves us with one and two so if you know third is wrong you can at least eliminate two options you don't have to worry about two which is a factual thing and you can apply a guess and probably answer a as the answer possibly you can make those guesses 42 which of the following statements is or are correct regarding mpc monetary policy committee 2016 came into effect 2017 ups has asked a question it decides rb rba's benchmark interest rates correct it is a 12 member body including the governor of rba and is reconstituted every year it is not reconstituted every year it is not a 12 member body it is a six member body okay it functions under the chairmanship of union finance minister no it includes the governor of rba it is monetary policy committee monetary policy is rba's committee the finance minister is there finance minister will have to be the chairperson then rba governor will have less of a role to play in that it will essentially be a government body then 
which is not true so 3 is wrong 2 is wrong answer is a one only very generic question that year current affairs most people should have been able to write this okay by eliminating 3 you have eliminated two options so the question is do you know the second one or not so six member body is what is the error over there okay and reconstituted every year is also not correct okay that ends the discussion on inflation we are moving to the third part i told you it's a three set of three money inflation and banking so the last part in that set is what we are going to discuss right now banking banking has quite a lot of questions there are 18 questions but you will notice that most of the questions are 2019 and backwards 2020 21 22 comparatively lesser number of questions have come from the area of banking because NPA as an issue is not as big a role uh, doesn't play as big a role in today's conversation in India as it did prior to 2019. Start with 43. With reference to Bank Both Bureau, which of the following statements are correct? The Governor of RBI is the Chairman of BBA, BBB. Uh, 2022 question. Something that we should have known, you should have known from the past itself. It is not the RBI Chairman. Uh, sorry, RBI Governor who is the Chairman. It's a separate person who is appointed. There were some issues originally when it was created. I'm not going into the issues that on going into that discussion now. But the first statement is wrong. If you know the first statement is wrong, automatically you are only left with one option, two and three. Let's look at the other ones. BBB recommends for selection of heads of PSBs. Yes, BBB helps the public sector banks in developing strategies and capital raising plans. Yes, that is the objective itself. There is a subsequent question regarding BBB, which we will be looking at as well. So the second point becomes very uh, important with respect to that, with respect to that particular question. So that is 43. 44. With reference to urban cooperative banks in India, consider the following statements. Now, this is a very, again, current affairs, very specific kind of a question. And a lot of people may not have known when they attended the uh, exam, this particular, those who have studied this area in detail, they might remember, but there are, there is a particular key that you can focus on, which will help you answer this. So they are supervised and regulated by local boards set up by the state governments. They can issue equity shares and preference shares. They were brought under the purview of Banking Regulations Act through an amendment in 1966. That's a very long time ago. So let us say you don't know any of these things, but there is still a little bit of logic that you can apply. It is supervised by local board set, local board set because it's a cooperative entity. It makes sense. There is the registrar of cooperative societies who might play a role there. Okay, or the state government itself directly. Regulated by, so supervision is reg different, regulation is different. Banks in India are regulated by Reserve Bank of India, as simple as that. Be it urban cooperative bank, if it has the name bank with it, RRB, uh, regional rural banks or cooperative banks or scheduled commercial banks, all of them. The supervision role, sometimes there is dual supervision that happens. Uh, NABARD plays a role in regulating RRBs. State government plays a role in supervising. But uh, supervision and regulation. So there is a role which is played by the RBA itself. Okay. So to say that they are supervised and regulated by local board set up, local board set up by the state government is wrong. The regulation is ultimately in the hands of the Reserve Bank of India. So the first statement, if you know that, that one is wrong. So you are left with only one option, two and three only, 44B. So this, these are the key things that you have to look for. Other than that, finding it or finding specific things. If you know it, you can answer. Otherwise, it's tough to guess. 45. In India, the central bank's function as the lender of last resort usually refers to which of the following? If you know the functions of Reserve Bank of India, you would know that the function as lender of last resort comes along with another term. RBA acts as a banker to the banks, but only as a lender of last resort. That is a complete function. RBA acts as a banker to the banks, but only as a lender of last resort. If you know that, the answer is evident. Lending to trade and industry bodies, it has nothing to do with lending of last resort. So industry bodies cannot go to RBA and say, I tried everywhere, you have to give me loan. No. RBA will ask, I don't even regulate you, why are you coming and asking me? So, no. Providing liquidity to banks having a temporary crisis, yes, because that is what is lending of last resort. When a bank is desperate, it tried everywhere, it couldn't get the money under the MSF facility, marginal standing facility, it can go to the RBI and say, please lend me some money, overnight money, I'll give it back the next morning. So that is what is lender of last resort, the MSF facility that is there. So second is correct. Lending to government to finance budgetary deficits, 
that is not lender that is rbi's role as a banker to the government not a banker to the banks that too rbi provides only loans under ways and means advances okay for a 90 day duration so that is not lender of last resort okay so the answer is b two only then we have moving on 46 what is the importance of the term interest coverage ratio of a firm in india this is uh, current affairs but you can make some guesses out of it so interest coverage ratio so there is uh, interest to cover the interest do you have enough money or not that is interest coverage ratio so the total interest obligations there is it is if you know the factual thing so there is the total earnings of the bank okay so the higher a firm's uh, borrowing um, sorry the higher a borrowing firm's level of interest coverage ratio the worse is its ability to service its debt so even if you don't know this formula if you know this formula it's very easy because numerator is greater means it's good more and more money is available to pay the interest it is a bet good indicator higher the interest coverage ratio the better is its ability to service its debt but even in general think of the word interest coverage ratio to cover for the interest the more i have to cover for the interest the better it is so the higher a firm's interest coverage ratio the better it is is a logic that you can apply sometimes the opposite may work out like in the case of incremental capital output ratio but there the name itself makes it evident capital output ratio so more capital required for generating an output so in such cases the reverse will be true but in this case the higher the icr the better is the ability to service the debt so third one is wrong if you know third one is wrong to move these two the only question is is it one two only or one and two so two is definitely correct it helps in evaluating the emerging risk of a firm that a bank is going to give loan to emerging risk future risk but not just the future risk in the present is the bank in a good situation or not does it have enough money to pay for its interest at present and in future so interest coverage ratio helps in understanding the present as well as the emerging risk of a firm the answer is 46 a 1 and 2 um it is not very easy to guess maybe you can eliminate 3 at most but to choose between 1 and 2 you should have some idea so logical answer to guess among a and b is a but again it's easy to sit here and say it's easy to guess a you have to think the right thing at the right moment in the exam hall to be able to know so it's better to know these terms because it was in the news is why this is asked so current affairs learning is very important in that case then service area approach something that is should be standard knowledge for everyone because lead bank scheme has been a landmark scheme it was 50 years since the launch of lead bank scheme in 2019 1969 they launched 2019 was the 50th anniversary so it is about the lead bank scheme so the answer is service area approach is to service a particular area the lead bank had to give a sort of strategy as to how what they are going to do what is the approach that they are going to take that is what is the service area approach all right so 47 b again factual no guessing nothing can be guessed over here because anything here mg nreg could be service area if you are guessing integrated rural development could also apply so if you don't know you can't answer this 48 which of the following is not included in the assets of a commercial bank in india this is something which you can apply the knowledge and answer what is not included inside assets of a bank what is asset asset is something which has the potential to earn money when you give a loan you earn money when you take a deposit you pay when you take a deposit you are effectively taking a loan loan is a liability assets liabilities they are opposites so instead of looking at the question as which of the following is not an asset you can look at it as which of the following is a liability of a bank any deposit that they take is a liability so that leaves it with only one answer b deposits deposits are the liabilities of a bank this is application this is something that is expected of everyone to write it's not current affairs base it is your knowledge and the application of the knowledge that is important here 49 what was the purpose of intercreditor agreement signed by indian banks and financial institutions recently current affairs of that time intercreditor agreement so between the organizations which are giving loans there is an agreement look at the options to lessen the government of india's perennial burden of this on fiscal deficit crediting or intercredit intercreditor means among the creditors who are the creditors banks have the creditors among them the agreement it has nothing to do with fiscal deficit and current account deficit to support in infrastructure projects 
very difficult to assume that to be right let's look at the other options also to act as an independent regulator in case of applications of loans for loans could be possibly to aim at faster resolution of stressed assets of 50 crore or more which are under consortium lending so actually if you know you would know that is what was the agreement for because the issue that was happening was a lot of times let's say five banks are involved in the process um to resolve so five banks together have given a loan a large scale loan okay the four banks have agreed saying this is the strategy that we are going to use the other bank whose exposure is actually very small only maybe 5% exposure they may say sorry i don't agree with your resolution i want the full money i want a change in plan so because there was never an agreement between them they could not resolve so they signed an agreement which says that if two thirds of the banks with exposure or banks with two thirds of exposure to the loan if they agree on a strategy they'll go ahead with the strategy okay so that is the uh, interpreter agreement so to aim at faster resolution of stress assets of 50 crore or more which are under consortium lending the 50 crore and all this is not important over here to aim for faster resolution of loans under consortium lending consortium means a group of bank have given loan because there is a group of loan uh, banks you need to have an interpreter agreement okay so at most you can eliminate a but b to some extent between c and d it's difficult if you don't know because agreement could mean anything so you need to know to answer this factual thing so current affairs based 49 d over here 50 i told you right bank boards bureau there is a question chairman of public sector banks are selected by they are appointed by the government no doubt but they are selected or at least the recommendations are provided by the bank boards bureau so that is the role of setting up a bank boards bureau itself so the answer is bank boards bureau okay error that you could make you if you know rbi will not be a part of your answer possibly you could think union ministry of finance because appointment is by the government but selection is what they are asked selection is not appointment selection is by the bank board bureau 50 a is the answer 51 reserve bank of india's storage of payment data system popularly known as data dikta command the payment system providers that again if you have been following the news of that time or if you had been at that time you would know a big issue was that even now to some extent but uh, the issue seems to be resolved a lot of our data the bank accounts and all those things and information were stored in servers which are located outside india okay because it was cheaper over there or whatever was the reason so the data dikkat said they shall ensure that the entire data relating to payment system operated by them are stored in a system only in india let's say something like amazon or flipkart itself they are operating out of india but any payment system related data has to be stored in india only so that is the data dikkat they shall ensure that the systems are owned and operated by ps public sector enterprises in an era of privatization highly unlikely although it is about user data but th there is no such public enterprise or no such uh, condition that will be too much of interference in the working of a firm they shall submit the consolidated system audit report by the cag uh, to the cag by the end of the calendar year they are not a public organization for them to do all those things so that is also not true the answer here is a one only okay so there is a little bit of guessing which is involved um, to some extent you can logically guess two and three are wrong uh, to some extent probably one if you know it you would know that is correct or logically also it makes sense for one to be correct Two and three are a little difficult to eliminate for some, but for some you might eliminate it correctly. So it depends on what you are thinking at that moment. Not a lot of scope for elimination as such here, but if you think on the right lines, possibly. Okay, fifty-two merchant discount rate. Uh, again, at that time it was just with after the demonetization with greater digital transactions to encourage digital transactions. There was a uh, condition that mdrs would be merchant discount rates would be waived off for a period of time and all those things so when we go to a store we buy a commodity and we pay using card so the merchant who is the one who is selling it they because the bank is facilitating the payment for them so the merchant has to pay a certain fees for the service that is provided because because the card payments are facilitated they are getting a customer so there might be a situation where a, a, bank, a store says sorry we don't accept card and a customer may walk out because it's inconvenient without a card for a lot of people these days right so the merchant in order to facilitate their business the bank is providing so many facilities the merchant has to pay for it that is merchant discount rate okay 
so there are three parties involved in this merchant discount rate the merchant pays a fee which will be divided among the one who is providing the point of sale service the payment service the bank into which the money is going which is the merchant's bank and the bank whose money is being used for payment the buyer's bank so there are three parties to it right so the uh, first of all it is not an incentive if you know that although the name says discount which is what is a misleading word although the name says discount it is not an incentive so if you know it is not an incentive you will rule out option a and d the amount paid by banks to their customers when they use debit card for financial transactions banks to customers why would they the charge to a merchant by a bank um for accepting payments so that is what is merchant discount rate c very difficult to guess if you know you know otherwise you might be misled by the term discount and you might think oh only a and d could be answer if you don't know anything you will straight away rule out b and c saying that discount means incentive so a or d has to be the answer so you might end up marking a or d so which is why guessing is very tricky in these kind of things if you don't know better not to answer these 53 consider the following statements um about capital equity ratio it is the amount that banks have to maintain in the form of their own funds to offset any loss that banks incur if the account holders fail to repay dues that is the definition of what is capital equity ratio that is correct but capital equity ratio is given to banks by the reserve bank of india it is not decided by individual banks again you need to know that to answer it but even without knowing that you can guess the first one because the name says capital adequacy ratio banks have to maintain um so sufficient funds have to be there in the hands of banks to offset any loss so adequate capital in that way you can probably guess the first statement as a proper definition the second one you need to know the rules regarding that so the answer here is 53 uh, a 54 with reference to the governments of public sector banking in india consider the following statements capital infusion into public sector banks by the government of india has steadily increased in the last decade so this word steadily increased again we had seen that previously so steadily increase means what government is becoming more and more involved in banking activities but what we are observing is that even in 2018 the government's intention has always always been to step out of it as much as possible the government does infuse capital under the indradhanu scheme for banking and all those things when a bank is in trouble when they are not able to meet their adequacy ratios and all those things so occasionally they did infuse capital but not steadily increasing which means every year they are increasing highly unlikely so the first statement is wrong over here to put the public sector banks in order the merger of associate banks with parent sbi has been affected or affected so should be affected not affected so two is correct over here so two only is the correct answer 2017 that happened 2018 the question about the mergers so 55 what is the purpose of setting up of small finance banks in india to supply credit to small businesses is generic so that is correct to supply credit to smaller marginal farmers is also correct because it's generic to encourage young entrepreneurs to set up business particularly in rural areas now you could argue that that is also correct but what is the purpose of setting up if the answer of the, if the third statement has to be correct there has to be some provision inside small finance banks which says that a certain proportion of the loans that they give should be given to people under the age of 25 or 30 or 35 or something like that unless that is there you cannot claim that the purpose is to encourage young entrepreneurs if it simply is to say to encourage entrepreneurs to set up business then also it might make sense okay but to say to encourage young entrepreneurs to set up businesses is very specific there has to be a provision corresponding to that okay so one and two are the more generic kind of statements so one and two is the answer three is very specific and there is no such specific provision inside the reason for setting up small finance banks so 55 a is the answer 56 most likely consequence of implementing upi so look at it mobile wallets will not be necessary for online payments which is true right because if you have gpa which is a upi interface you don't have to store your money in a wallet like in paytm or amazon pay wallet or something like that you can directly pay from your bank account so that is what it removes the need for mobile wallets so a is correct but let's look at most likely consequence digital currency will totally replace physical currency absolute statement fdi inflows will drastically increase absolute statement you can rule out those direct transfer of subsidies to poor people will become very effective with greater digitization and greater penetration of banking system this will happen 
but does upa have a role to play to some extent maybe so you have to choose between a and d okay so a and d what is the immediate consequence that we are likely to witness mobile wallets not being necessary is more likely but usually we go for answer in d because that is the more government kind of an answer right government benefit and all those things that is not the reason here it is a purely banking related benefit that wallets will not be necessary so a is the answer not d and direct transfers to subsidies will uh, direct transfer of subsidies will be poor if you simply have a to the poor will become better if you simply have a bank account it is not necessary that upa has to be there it can be useful but that is not the answer over here most likely consequence is a okay that is 56 57 which of the following statements best describes s4a the scheme doesn't even exist anymore it took 2017 in current affairs look at the words scheme for the sustainable structuring of stressed assets if you know that stressed asset refers to let's say npas then you would know that one is not part of the answer but if you don't know what is stressed asset you might think of ecological stress stress on the area that might come in and all those things so a if you know it is related to a banking sector or if you know it is related to npas a cannot be the answer c cannot be the answer so it has to be b or d but b is a law that the government has enacted it's an act that the government has enacted so that is a government measure but s4a is a scheme of the rbi for reworking financial structure s4a is different insolvency and bankruptcy code is different both would be for the same purpose but they are two different things so b is the answer over here not d so if you know it is an rbi scheme and not a government scheme you would know b is the answer if not a little tough between b and d 58 the establishment of payment banks is allowed in india which is correct regarding this mobile telephone companies supermarket chains that are owned that are owned and controlled by residents are eligible to be promoters of payments bank airtel payments bank if you are aware 2016 licenses were just about to be given or just about given uh, but in the present you can say this is correct payments bank can issue both credit and debit cards payment banks cannot undertake lending activities what is the logic here 2 and 3 cannot be correct at the same time because if a payment bank cannot undertake lending activity how can they issue credit card so 2 and 3 cannot be correct at the same time if you have 2 inside it you cannot have 3 inside it as well so that is removed you know one is correct so if you know one is correct so c is eliminated it's between 1 and 2 and 1 and 3 the uniqueness of payments bank is that they can accept deposits up to 1 lakh but they cannot give loans so they are not allowed to issue credit cards either so the answer is 1 and 3 so this is wrong as well so b 1 and 3 is the correct answer you can eliminate to some extent but not a lot again you need to know to answer okay 59 the term core banking solution sometimes seen in the news which of the following statements best describes this term it is a network of a bank's branches and enables customers to operate their accounts from any branch of the bank on its network regardless of where they open their accounts from this is correct is a generically correct statement about what is core banking solution it's an effort to increase rbi's control over commercial banks through computerization rbi is trying to give more freedom to the banks liberalization so that as a general answer cannot be correct it is a detailed process uh, sorry it is a detailed procedure by which a bank with huge npas will be taken over by another bank no the answer is a one only but again you need to know what is cbs you cannot randomly guess you can at least say okay two cannot be correct because that is not the pathway in which india is moving so if you know two cannot be correct you can eliminate these two so one has to be correct so if one has to be correct how can three be correct these are two uh, separate processes right in that way you can probably arrive at a as the correct answer okay so guessing can be done over here if you go on the premise that rbi will not want to control banks more and more but if you think that banks are in so much trouble so rbi is attempting to control them then you cannot if you think that way then you cannot make guesses so you will have to think the right thing again that is a trick it's not a trick that can be learned it's that moment what we so maybe in a way you could say depending on what we think at that moment okay 60 what is or are purpose or purposes of mclr announced by rbi 2016 at that time it was current affairs we have now sort of brought in a parallel system called as external benchmarking of loans so this still there but it's older news guidelines to him help 
improve transparency in methodology followed by banks for determining interest rate correct we were using a system called as base rate which had multiple uh, formulas which could be used by the banks mclr narrowed it down to just one formula to make it more transparent in how banks were determining interest rates helps in bringing about a fair interest rate for both borrower as well as lender so this is also a correct statement both one and two are correct again it is not something which was very difficult to answer at that point of time if you had heard of mclr you know what the benefit of mclr was at that point of time even now so what are the benefits of external benchmarking of loans right now very similar more transparent mechanism of more transparent than mclr and uh, it helps in giving better rates more market aligned rates to the customers so easy uh, your external benchmark based loans are better uh, than mclr for these purposes so constant improvements keep happening right so 60 answer is c with that we are done with the banking sector as well banking questions as well so the one segment that i told you about your um, um yeah, sorry money bank money inflation and banking that set of questions is done we have only two more areas to cover one is external sector one is financial markets okay so external sector uh, has a lot of questions 22 questions whereas financial market only has five questions towards the end so the focus here is on external sector so we'll start with external sector now with reference to the indian economy consider uh, the following statements an increase in near indicates the neer nominal effective exchange rate indicates the appreciation of rupee an increase in real effective exchange rate indicates an improvement in the trade competitiveness then an increasing trend in domestic inflation relative to inflation in other countries is likely to cause an increasing divergence between near and rear okay so if you don't know what is near and rear in detail you will find it hard to answer this question but there is still something that we can use to eliminate options that probably increase our chances of getting it right because there is a logic over here okay let's look at the third statement first an increasing trend in domestic inflation relative to inflation in other countries is likely to cause an increasing divergence between near and rear the first thing that we need to understand is whenever you find the word in the context of economics nominal versus real what is the difference between them not difference in subtraction difference between the two terminologies is nominal does not consider inflation real takes into account inflation removes the effect of inflation so the difference between them is inflation this one does not consider inflation this removes the inflation that is there so an increasing trend in domestic inflation related to inflation in other countries is likely to cause an increasing divergence between near and rear okay now take another place where you have the concept of nominal and real nominal gdp real gdp if there is high level of inflation the divergence between them will be very high if there is very less if there is no inflation at all nominal and real gdp will be equal if there is no inflation at all so isn't it logical to say that an increasing trend in domestic inflation related to inflation in other countries which means here there is more inflation than in somewhere else and why are two countries coming into the picture because we are talking about effective exchange rate between two currencies it is likely to cause an increasing divergence between near and rear which is true because there is inflation coming in there is greater divergence between two countries why are they talking about divergence is because if you look at the formula for rear rear is equal to near into domestic inflation divided by foreign inflation that particular countries okay so if both the countries inflation is happening by the same extent near and near rear will be very close to each other so it's not just about domestic inflation it's about the foreign inflation also which is why the two are being compared if domestic inflation is greater than uh, foreign uh, inflation the divergence will become greater okay so this is the concept that we need to know so the third statement logically is correct okay so which means a is eliminated now the question is 1 and 2 between 1 and 2 is both 1 and 2 correct that is again something that we can discuss because let's say we don't know what is appreciation and we don't know what is depreciation when it comes to near okay but we know one thing other than inflation near and rear will move very similarly because both are same concepts the only difference between them is inflation okay the gap will widen but if near is going up rear will also go up the gap might be wider because of inflation but if near is going up rear will also go up 
if near is going down rear will also go down now an increase in near indicates appreciation of rupee let's assume that to be true let's assume that to be true so near is appreciation now if you know the concepts of appreciation and depreciation just simple terms 1 dollar is equal to rupees 50 is becoming 1 dollar is equal to rupees 100 let's extreme this is depreciation of indian rupee so indian rupee is depreciating now is this depreciation good for exports or bad for exports previously when i exported i was exporting something and earning 1 dollar it was fetching only 6 50 rupees now as an exporter when i export something for 1 dollar i am getting 100 rupees which means i am benefiting as an exporter previously also is getting 1 dollar now also i am getting 1 dollar but because the indian rupee has depreciated the 1 dollar is fetching me 100 rupees today whereas previously it was fetching 50 rupees so i will be more incentivized to produce an export so exporters are incentivized by depreciation of rupee not appreciation of rupee okay now keep this in mind the same logic applies here an increase in near indicates appreciation let us say that is true an increase in rear so increase in near has happened increase in rear is happening now i told you other than inflation both will work very similarly an increase in rear indicates an improvement in trade competitiveness when are you more competitive with respect to trade when your uh, exports are increasing and your imports are decreasing now if near increase is resulting in appreciation then rear is also appreciating uh, rear increase is also indicating appreciation of rupee appreciation of rupee will result in indian trade becoming less competitive when do we become more competitive when our currency is depreciating because depreciating currency encourages exports discourages imports so if the first statement is true second statement cannot be true so one and two both cannot be part of the same answer so d is removed now we'll have to choose between <laughs> one and two okay which is again a challenge all this discussion just to eliminate those two options without knowing we won't be able to guess usually we say a usually we say when rupees value from 50 it is the dollars value 50 is becoming 100 this is increase increase is uh, depreciation is what we say right with respect to when 1 dollar is equal to 50 becomes 1 dollar is equal to 100 the amount that you have to pay for a dollar is increasing so dollar is appreciating but rupee is depreciating is what we say whenever we see an increase from 50 to 60 60 to 70 70 to 80 we talk about it as depreciation but rear and near is not mentioned like this the same formula can be written as 1 rupee is equal to 1 by 50 dollar or in simpler case let's say 1 dollar is equal to 1 rupee has become 1 dollar is equal to 2 rupees so that equation sorry uh, that equation you will write it as 1 rupee is equal to 1 dollar has become 1 rupee is equal to half a dollar now when near and rear are calculated this is not how it is written it is written this way so what is happening so if near is increasing it means that 1 rupee is equal to and i know near is not with respect to dollar for convenience i am talking about it in terms of dollar okay if 1 rupee is equal to 1 dollar has become 1 rupee is equal to 2 dollars it means that rupee is appreciating so near is represented as 1 rupee is equal to how much okay in terms of many other currencies it is written that way so that is how it is written so your normal currency is written in terms of the foreign currency because indian currency is weaker but when it comes to near and rear the representation itself is in terms of 1 rupee is equal to how much of it so an increase will indicate appreciation a decrease will indicate depreciation okay so the first statement is correct i am not going into explaining and teaching what is near but in simple terms you do this for instead of one currency you do it for so there are different baskets there is a basket of six currencies a basket of 40 currencies you take those 40 currencies you do this for each currency you give a different weightage for each currency and finally you arrive at one value which is called as normal effective exchange rate it is indian rupees value in comparison not just one currency in comparison to a basket of 40 currencies at present okay that is what is near so i am not going to the detail of it the answer here is factually speaking uh first statement is correct second statement is wrong so the answer is c 1 and 3 only so that is the answer to the 61st a lot of effort goes in to ultimately narrow it down to two still we'll have to make a guess so if you don't know this better to leave and move on but again how many questions can you leave like that becomes a question okay
moving on to 62 uh, the other questions won't require so much of discussion but you'll see with reference to the indian economy consider the following statements if the inflation is too high rbi is likely to buy government securities so inflation is too high means what there is already excess money supply in the economy when rbi buys government securities what is likely to happen rbi will supply money buying securities means they are giving money it will further increase the money supply so if inflation is too high rbi is likely to buy government securities is wrong so if one is wrong the only answer is b you don't need to know anything actually i have put it under the heading of external sector because statements 2 and 3 are both about external sector but you don't need to know external sector you just need to know the uh, rbi's say open market operation to answer this question first statement you eliminate two and three are the possible answers let's look at the second and third statement as well if rupee is rapidly depreciating which means what when would your currency depreciate when the demand for foreign currency is greater than the supply of foreign currency that is when domestic currency will depreciate more people are asking for the foreign currency than is available so how to prevent the depreciation rbi will take foreign currency from its reserves and sell it in the market so second statement is correct rb will try to increase the supply of foreign currency in the market then if the interest rates in the us or european union were to fall that is likely to induce rb to buy dollars so what will happen if interest rates are high in the foreign country look uh, you know, tempted by the higher interest rates investors from here will leave to the foreign destination but if interest rates there are falling which is what is the conventional norm so you will find investors coming into india so there will be an excess supply of foreign currency in india so excess supply will have to be met with by rbi purchasing those dollars otherwise indian currency will appreciate too much to prevent that appreciation excessive appreciation is bad for exports to prevent that excessive appreciation rbi would be induced to buy dollars so second and third statements are the two ends of the spectrum both are correct so 62 answer is b 63 which one of the following situations best reflects indirect transfers often talked about in media recently with respect to uh, with reference to india um, this is something which was current affairs it's not conventionally part of classroom discussions or anything so indirect transfers it may not be relevant going forward either so what is the concept of indirect transfers it came into the news because of the whole vodafone issue and that uh, retrospective taxation that india had uh, imposed okay so just taking the example of vodafone itself so there is a company called as vodafone which is registered in a foreign country a parent company which is registered in a foreign country okay there is a company called as hutch which was what vodafone was previously okay so there is this hutch which is registered again in a foreign country let's say factually speaking this is registered in cayman islands this is registered in netherlands then there is in india we have a company called as hutch india an indian version of hutch so there is a global hutch this is hutch global let's say this is hutch india so who owns hutch india hutch global owns hutch india vodafone goes and buys from hutch global hutch india okay so an indian company is bought by vodafone in a foreign country so the transaction is happening on an indian entity abroad the transaction is happening abroad but ultimately vodafone becomes the owner of hutch india and it becomes vodafone india so this is what happens this is what is called as indirect transfer okay so a foreign company in this case hutch global transfers the shares okay to another foreign company and such shares derive their substantial value from assets located in india the shares derive their value from hutch india which is located in india this process is what is called as indirect transfer so d is the answer what is indirect transfer they didn't go into any other questions of what happened what is the retrospective taxation all those things simply what is indirect transfer when a deal is happening between two entities who are located abroad on an asset which is located in india the question is can this be taxed or not till 2012 the taxation didn't make it explicit that this could be taxed india changed this law in 2012 saying that they could be taxed but the problem that uh, we faced is we made it retrospective from 1960s it was made applicable okay so uh, these transactions which took place prior to 2012 also came under the ambit and that became a whole issue so that is the indirect transfers question on that moving on to 64 which of the above statements are correct 
tight monetary policy of federal reserve could lead to capital flight we just discussed that in the previous question in fact in the same year there are two questions which are on a very similar line look at this if interest rates in rbi uh, were to fall okay falling interest rates mean what uh, an expansionary policy is being followed is what it means so rbi is likely to buy dollars because capital inflow would happen the opposite is given over here in the same year tight monetary policy means us federal is raising interest rates could result in existing investors going to their uh, home country or usa so could result in capital flight from india so the first statement is correct capital flight may increase the cost of firms uh, with existing sorry uh, may increase the interest cost of firms with existing like, external commercial borrowings see when the government borrows they'll try as much as possible to borrow at a fixed interest rate okay but when commercial borrowings happen more often than not the interest rates are flexible when we go to a bank to borrow for a housing loan or a vehicle loan all those things most often it's flexible interest rate so commercial borrowing happens on flexible interest rate so when there is a capital flight there is a shortage of foreign funds available when there is a shortage of foreign funds interest rate goes up so it may increase the interest cost of firms not that it will but it may increase so you can't deny that so second statement is also correct devaluation of domestic currency decreases the currency risk associated with ecbs devaluation means what 1 dollar is equal to rupees 50 becomes 1 dollar is equal to i'm taking an extreme example rupees 100 so previously if you had to repay 1 dollar external commercial borrowing happens in foreign currency if you had to repay 1 dollar we only had to earn 50 rupees now because of devaluation to repay the same 1 dollar we have to earn 100 rupees so it increases the currency risk associated with external commercial borrowing to repay whenever we have to repay it's better to have a highly valued currency highly valued is this is highly valued currency this is lowly valued currency because depreciation is happening right depreciation is bad for external commercial borrowings so the third statement is wrong only the first two statements are correct that's 64 65 Consider the following. This is 2021. Which of the above can be included in FDI? Now, this is a bit of a challenging question because look at it. Bonds, bonds. We say is portfolio investment. Foreign institutional investment. We know is portfolio investment. GDRs are also issued in the share market. Portfolio investment. Non-resident external deposits. Deposits in banks by non-residents. That is definitely not an investment at all. It is a loan. okay so what is fdi over here you don't have an option of none of the above so we we'll have to re understand okay which of the above can be included which means you have to say okay under some circumstances can it be included let's look at it once again there is only one option here which we can completely eliminate because if a non resident is depositing money in their bank account in india it becomes a loan for india not an investment it becomes a loan it is not a part of the current account it is not remittances it is nra deposits so nra deposits money in an indian bank it is a liability for a bank if the nra deposits in relatives account it is a liability for the bank but internal liability an nra deposits in their own account it is a liability it's an external liability so this is not foreign direct investment it is loan it is part of capital account but it is loan so four cannot be part of the answer definitely not the question is is it only gdr global deposit receipt or is it 1 2 and 3 now if you know the rules of investment you know that if fii foreign institutional investment or foreign portfolio investment becomes 10 percentage or more then the foreign portfolio investment will be retreated will be reclassified as foreign direct investment so which means what tools can be under it can be with certain conditions it can be treated as foreign direct investment so two has to be a part of the answer so we we'll have to go for a and what is the explanation for the others foreign currency convertible bonds what can they be converted into bonds can be converted to shares so if they are converted to shares it could be treated as direct investment especially if it is not uh, in the form of shares which are frequently traded or if it is the value is greater than 10 percentage then it can be treated as foreign direct investment similarly if those shares can be then it's only logical to assume that gdrs can also be if depending on the proportion so any investment that comes in the share market if it crosses the breaches the mark of 10 percentage it can be classified as direct investments so the answer here best answer that is available is a 1 2 and 3 because if 3 can be then obviously 1 and 2 can also be 
Okay, so A is the answer over here. But you can go for this by eliminating four first of all, and then looking at the condition of foreign portfolio investment, the ten percent condition that is there. There was this Mayaram committee recommendation based on which it was decided. Okay, moving to sixty-six. Consider the following statements: the effect of devaluation. So it improves the competitiveness of domestic exports in the foreign markets is a possible answer because we just saw devaluation or depreciated currency encourages exports. So that's one possible answer. Increases the foreign value of domestic currency. Foreign value of domestic currency is actually decreased. Devaluation itself means decrease in the value of domestic currency. So this is definitely wrong. Decreases the foreign value of domestic currency is correct. So two is eliminated from options. So the only question is: Is it one only or three only? You don't have one and three. If it was there, we might actually choose it. So either one only or three only improves trade balance. Now, both of these may happen, but the question is what necessarily happens. Which means what is the first step? So what happens? One dollar is equal to again one dollar is equal to rupees fifty has become one dollar is equal to rupees one hundred. Okay. First thing that will happen is that. a commodity which we were previously selling at $1 let's say a pen in the international market is equal to $1 we can now sell the same pen at half a dollar why can we sell it at half a dollar because the value indian rupee value has de been devalued so previously an indian exporter had to sell it at $1 to get the 50 rupees now to get the same 50 rupees they can sell it at half a dollar which means the price of the commodity falls law of demand says when the price falls the demand will increase so our exports can be made competitive okay so it can that is the first level okay it can make the competitiveness of domestic exports because it can result in reduction in price of the commodity so the first statement is definitely correct it is definitely going to happen but the question the second question that comes in is does it actually result in increase in exports there is no guarantee it can encourage exports but does india have the capability to export more maybe we don't have what if raw materials are not available what if exporters are not able to export more it makes the export more attractive that is what the first statement says the third statement what it means is that it will actually result in increase in exports and decrease in imports may not happen because even if your indian currency becomes uh, you no know, devalued and imports become costly importers may continue importing because import might be of an essential commodity Okay, this is the reason why even though we have depreciating currency, we continue to import more and more. That is why continuous depreciation happens. Otherwise, the trade cycle will follow where depreciation will eventually result in appreciation. Okay, so improving trade balance is a possible scenario theoretically. But what is necessarily going to happen? The first step is what is necessarily going to happen. So A one only. Eliminating it to just one and three is easy, but choosing one is a little tricky. Okay. moving on gold tranche refers to uh, reserve tranche gold tranche is not a term that i have myself uh, seen in the context of imf but they have used it but reserve tranche makes it very obvious it is reserve tranche position rtp one of the forex components imf it's a facility provided by imf okay so reserve tranches we have a quota uh, which is the membership fee 25% of that quota we have to pay in foreign currency that is considered as reserve tranche position which we can borrow uh, interest free whenever we need that money so it's a credit system for all its member countries that imf provides so that is the answer over here no eliminations nothing you know it you can answer if not leave it and move on 68 if another global financial crisis happens in the near future which of the following policies or actions or policies are most likely to give some immunity to india okay so how to protect ourselves from global financial crisis not depending on short term foreign borrowings because if you have short term borrowings this is something in earlier question that i discussed with respect to government borrowings being long term or short term in very very early question so not depending on short term foreign borrowings means we don't have to immediately repay which means the crisis will not affect us immediately so this is definitely a good thing to happen it is likely to give some immunity to india not depending on short term foreign borrowings opening up to more foreign banks global crisis can enter india imagine if credit suisse or silicon valley bank had branches in india so the global crisis would be in india also 
because that is what is currently happening that's why i'm taking those examples so two is definitely not something to be done so which eliminates these two and if one is correct three cannot be correct so a is the answer maintaining full capital account convertibility means we might get a lot of inflow of money into the capital account but it might also result in um, sudden outflow capital flight may happen so that is not part of the answer answer is a one only that's 68 69 with reference to foreign direct investment in india which one of the following is considered its major characteristic so the question is essentially define what is fdi if you look at the options it's an investment through capital instru instruments essentially in a listed company this could be true if you are talking about greater than the 10 percentage limit okay so possible it is largely non debt creating capital flow it is investment which involves debt servicing which is not true because debt servicing means loan repayment uh, it is or interest payments on that it is the investment made by foreign institutional investors in gsex that is definitely not because there is no investment in the company which is coming in of one and two you have to choose uh, the more generic answer it is the investment uh, through capital instruments so fdi versus fpi this would be fpi uh, if you have to classify so non debt creating inflow is a more generic definition of it so b is what is the answer over here so in 2020 there was no confusion you look at it you would immediately say first is fpi second is fti it was easy to answer but in the context of the other question which upsc asked subsequently so this particular question now it raises question what is fpi what is fti because you look at it on the face of it everything looks like fpi where is fti would come in so then you go into the details of it some conditions can be included and all those things come in which raises the confusion but when in 2020 this particular question came there was no doubt uh, it was directly b as the answer anyway moving on 70 with reference to trade related investment measures which of the following statements is or are correct see if you don't know very difficult to answer and very minute differences also there is one very important key if you know about trims you know that it is an investment it is an agreement only for goods and if you know that if you know that then even if you don't know 1 and 3 you can still arrive at the answer they apply to investment measures related to both uh, related to trade in both goods and services if you know it is wrong two is wrong means you are only left with one answer you don't need to know 1 and 3 you can still answer the correct answer as c so there are always which is why i told you earlier mentioned this earlier as well we can never be sure that we can prepare entirely but whatever we prepare if we know the basics of it and basics of trims means it is only applicable for goods is one of the basic knowledge of it so if you know that then two can be eliminated if two is eliminated you don't need to know one and three you can arrive at the answer as c okay so 70 that is the answer 71 consider the following statements the value of indo this is like a trend based question what has happened over the last decade the value of indo sri lanka trade has consistently increased in the last decade consistently increase is the key point and sri lanka is a country which has been over the decade right they have been having a flux lot of internal strife and all those things over the years now they are having other external crisis also so doubtful statement consistently increase is very difficult to uh, assume to be true uh textile and textile articles constitute an important important item of trade between india and bangladesh cotton very important part jute very important part so two is possibly correct and they don't say consistently increase in all this constitute an important part that's all that they say in the last 5 years nepal has been the largest trading partner of india in south asia i think uh, recently or sometime back bangladesh became the second biggest uh, economy in south asia i think overtaking pakistan which raises a question is nepal really that big a trading partner or does bangladesh have a role to play there in bangladesh if you look at the countries with which we trade export import from bangladesh is present in the trading scenario so nepal being the largest trading partner is a little difficult to believe so these are logics if you know factually you would know the answer is two only but some logic can be applied here okay lucky it will turn out to be true the answer here is b two only only the second statement is correct only the second statement is generic this is an absolute this is an absolute consistently increasing so absolutes there are always doubts about absolutes okay so 71 is done 72 factual which among the following 
uh, among the following, which is the largest exporter of rice in the world in the last five years? Another trend-based question. The answer is India. So the, what we need to know with respect to this is, what do you need to learn? You should know what are the items in which India is a leading producer. India might be in second position or third position in certain things. Who is the leader in those items? All those things are very important things as observations. When economic survey is published, what to do, learn in economic survey? These are the observations that we have to take from economic survey. What are commodities in which India is doing exceptionally well when it comes to exports? And what are the major import items of India? You will see a following question in the same year. This is 2019, right? In 2019 itself, you will see a very similar question. We will get to it. Then, uh, next question. Consider the following statements. Most of India's external debt is owed by governmental entities. One of the biggest advantage that India at present has, which might protect us from sovereign debt crisis, external sovereign debt crisis, is that government's dependence on foreign loans are very, very minimal. Very small, less than 10% or maybe even less than close to 5%, that's all, of government's debt is from external sources. Most of government's debt, more than 90% is from internal sources. So to say most of India's external debt is owed by government entities is wrong. External commercial borrowing is the highest. Banks borrowing, bank deposits, NRIs depositing money is the second. And third comes governmental entities. So the first statement is wrong. Again, if you have analyzed the budget and all those, you will know this to be wrong. Or even take the external sector debt. There is a separate chart which survey provides. Analyze it, you will know. All of India's external debt is denominated in US dollars. If you have heard of something called as masala bonds, you know that is external debt in Indian currency. We borrow in other currencies also. So all of India's external debt. Most of India's external debt, yes, because highest contribution of external debt or highest external debt is in the form of US dollars, followed by rupee denominated debt. Okay, so extreme statement. Neither of the statements is correct. 73D. 74. Okay. In the context of India, which of the following factors is or are contributor contributors to reducing the risk of a currency crisis? Okay. Currency crisis should not be there. Currency has to be stable. That is the idea. Um, foreign currency earnings of India's IT sector. As you earn more foreign currency, there is more stability because if there is excess demand, we can use this currency to, sub, uh, to meet the excess demand. If there is excess supply, RB can of course take it more under control. So this is something that will definitely help in reducing the risk of currency crisis. Increasing the government expenditure. Increasing the government expenditure means more money is supplied. As more money is supplied, people have more money in their hands. As a result, people can go and demand more of foreign currency. So it is a measure that may result in a further currency crisis. Excess money supply could be a factor which results in that. So not a correct answer. Okay, Remittances from Indians abroad increases the supply of foreign currency. So the idea is this. To bring stability in the value of currency, supply should be encouraged because RBI can control the supply. If they want, they can take away the foreign currency if necessary. Okay and reduce the demand. So this will further increase the demand, second option. So second option will further increase the demand for foreign currency, can. So that is not an answer. These two, one and three will uh, result in or can result in increase in inflow, supply of foreign currency. So that is what is the answer. 74 D. 75, which of the following is issued by registered foreign portfolio investors to overseas investors who want to be part of Indian stock market without registering themselves directly or anonymous investment is in the form of participatory notes. So a one who wants to invest in the Indian market, but not directly without revealing who they are, without registering with SEBI, they will go to a foreign investor and say, please invest on my behalf without telling my name. So the foreign investor will issue a, a proof of this money that you are participating in this process. So a participatory note. Then foreign investor will bring the money to India. SEBI will ask who is investing this money. They'll say, I issued a participatory note. It's anonymous investment. I am investing on behalf of some person. So that is participatory note. There are accusations that a lot of black money laundering happens through participatory note. Terror financing can happen through participatory note. So that is because of the anonymity that is involved. So that is why it is a topic or it is a, an area which is widely criticized or discussed in the news. That is why it was in the question also. So it is current affairs of that particular period. It is still relevant, but not so much in discussion these days. 
PPP exchange rates are calculated by comparing the uh, prices of same basket of goods and services in different countries. It's actually uh, correct because same basket, different country, what is the price? The exchange rate is arrived at that way. That is what is the definition of purchasing power parity in PPP dollars. India is the sixth largest economy in the world. See, UPC doesn't usually ask number-based questions as in what is India's rank, what is India's question that UPC doesn't ask. Okay, so there is some logic here also. This is not the UPC's intention. Sixth largest at that time, in terms of your normal exchange rate, one dollar is equal to at that time 50, 60 or 70 rupees, whatever it was, 65 rupees. So, in terms of that, India was the sixth largest normal market exchange rate. In terms of PPP, India was the third largest. In terms of PPP, India still continues to be the third largest. In terms of usual exchange rate, India is the fifth largest right now. So it is not knowing the number, it is understanding in terms of PPP or in terms of the normal exchange rate, which is the one where we are at. And if you know a little bit about PPP, even if you don't know the rank, we can say something. Okay. One dollar is equal to one dollar is equal to rupees 80 is what is our current exchange rate, let's say. In terms of PPP, it would be something like one dollar is equal to 22 rupees or uh, 25 rupees. Let's round it as 20. Now, if you are converting, India's GDP is let's say 200 and uh, let's assume 240 uh, trillion rupees or lakh crore rupees. You are dividing it by 80, you will get a value of 3 lakh crore. Okay. In terms of dollars or 3 trillion dollars, you divide the same 240 by 20, you will get a much higher value, which will be how much? Now 12. Correct? 12 lakh crore. So in terms of PPP, India's GDP would be much, much higher. So many times, four times higher. Okay, which means that in usual terms, if India is in sixth or fourth position in PPP, it is likely that we are higher. It is likely. Okay, some logic can also be applied to assume that that you need to have some prior knowledge. You need to know these exchange rates. You need to know that India is sixth largest or fifth largest in terms of normal. But if you know all those things, it is likely that you would go second statement is wrong. But you can apply some logic as well. But at least the base of it, first statement you know for sure is correct. So either one or uh, third is correct. In this case, the second statement is wrong. So the answer is A, one only. Okay. 77, which is what I told you, a very similar question from earlier. So we had a question which was question number 72, 2019. In the same 2019, uh, they have asked a question 77 which is among the agricultural commodities imported. That is about export, rice exporter. This is about among the agricultural commodities imported by India, which of the following accounts for the highest imports in terms of value in the last five years. So in terms of value, spices are valuable, no doubt. Foods are valuable, pulses are valuable. But oil, the value tends to be high. India is a large consumer of oil. In terms of oil, in terms of value, it was vegetable oils. A lot of these things we import. Pulses we export, we import also. Fresh fruits we export, we import also. Spices we export, maybe we import also. I'm not sure. But vegetable oils definitely is a, we are an importer and that is the, that was the highest at that point of time at least. That is how, that is what the data said. Again, you this is what or you observe from economic survey analysis. Okay. So 77, the answer is D, 78. Which one of the following is not the most likely measure the government or the RBA takes to stop the slide of Indian rupee? So we have to stop the slide of Indian rupee. Some measures are to be taken. That is not the answer. What should it not do? So the question is, what should the government do or the RBA do to further let the currency depreciate? Slide means depreciate, drop in value. So what should the government do to further aid depreciation? Or how can Indian currency depreciate further? Okay, which means the demand for foreign currency should further be encouraged or the supply of foreign currency should be discouraged. That is the answer. Curbing imports of non-essential goods, supply will be, the demand will be reduced. So this is not the answer. Encouraging Indian borrowers to issue rupee denominated masala bonds that reduces the demand for foreign currency. Okay, wait, uh, that is something that we need to uh, discuss further because encouraging Indian borrowers to issue rupee denominated masala bonds means that in some way, rupee denominated bonds will, okay, it will actually increase the supply. So that is definitely, you know, it's a rupee denominated, but what is going to come in is foreign currency only. It will increase the supply. 
So that will also prevent depreciation. That is not the answer. Easing conditions relating to external commercial borrowing, which will mean more borrowing can happen, which will mean more supply of foreign currency, which is not what we want. Following an expansionary monetary policy, I told you earlier, the government spending increases was an earlier question. Following an expansionary monetary policy, more money supply in the hands of people with more Indian rupee, they will demand more foreign currency. So demand for foreign currency will increase. If they do this, that is likely to further aid the slide or depreciation of Indian rupee. So the answer is D. Once again, this not makes this question more complicated than what it should. So D is the answer over here with respect to what will aid further depreciation of Indian currency. 79. Consider the following statements. The quantity of imported edible oil is more than the domestic production of edible oils in the last five years. The quantity of imported edible oil is more than the domestic production. So why would that be the case? Because uh, the consumption is very, very high. And India is renowned as one of the largest consumers of edible oils. So that is something that is likely to be true, but you can only know with facts. Second, the government does not impose any customs duty on all imported edible oils as a special case. Does not impose any customs duty on all very, very extreme statements, even though they have as a special case, highly unlikely to be true. Second statement, you can rule out. Okay, so the question is, is the first one right or wrong? India is a major consumer of edible oils. Again, read the economic survey, at least the highlights of it, you just these specific parts, budget, external sector, you would have an idea about this. So the first statement is correct. 79, the answer is A, one only. Moving to 80, with reference to IFC Masala bonds, so International Finance Corporation Masala bonds, sometimes seen in the news, which of the statements given below is or are correct? The IFC which offers these is an arm of World Bank. It is not about masala bonds. It's about organizational structure, which is actually true. They are rupee denominated bonds and are a source of debt financing for uh, public and private sector. Current affairs of that time, masala bonds, you'd wonder why they are called masala bonds because they are rupee denominated. So there are, I think, panda bonds which are issued in the case of China. So rupee denominated bonds, correct. Next question is public and private sector. Is it true? That's also, it also happens to be true. Factually, both one and two are correct. 81. We are moving towards the end of uh, external sector. Couple of more questions. That's all. Recently, which one of the following currencies has been proposed to be added to the basket of IMF SDR 2016? Previously, there were uh, other currencies. Reorganization happened and Chinese currency was added inside it. And third biggest weightage, if I'm not wrong. The five currencies are US dollar, Euro, Renminbi, uh, Japanese Yen and Pound Sterling. Those are the five currencies that are there in the SDR basket of currencies. The ruble is not there, Rand, Rupee is not there. We would eventually want Rupee to be a part as well if sufficient international internationalization of Rupee happens. But this is a very old question, 2016 question. Okay, 82. Which of the following best describes the term import cover sometimes seen in the news? Again, interest coverage ratio cover, import cover, cover, cover means do you have sufficient money for the particular purpose? Look at the options. You can, you should be able to arrive at the answer. Ratio of value of imports to GDP. It is the total value of imports of a country in a year. It is the ratio between value of exports and that of imports between two countries. It is the number of months of imports that could be paid for by a country's international reserves. Covering for imports. How much money do we have to pay for imports? So D is the logical answer to it. Okay. So based on that word import cover, we can assume D to be the answer. Even if you don't specifically know what the answer is. Okay. So that was 82. Moving to the last segment, which is uh, financial market. Just five questions here, all of them very recent. Consider the following statements. 2022, there was a big controversy about this organization called as Brickwork Ratings. There were questions raised on the credibility of the ratings provided by them on their working mechanism and all those things. Very recently also, RBS announced that banks for their basal norms, the risk weighting of assets, they can get it approved from a set of rating agencies. Brickworks Ratings has been removed from the list. So this is a context. Credit rating agencies are regulated by RBI. 
they are regulated by sebi rbi provides accreditation to certain rating agencies but they are regulated by sebi sebi decides whether they can be a rating agency or not so the first statement is wrong answer is b the rating agency popularly known as icra is a public limited company public limited doesn't mean government owned public limited means shares of them are available in common platform they are taking they have done initial public offering or follow on public offering common public can come and invest in their shares so they are brickwork rating is an international indian credit rating agency is correct so if you know the first one is wrong you can arrive at the answer even without knowing the other two so 83 b is the answer 84 with reference to convertible bonds convertible bonds means they can be converted to something technically they can be converted to shares of a company there is an option to exchange the bond for equity shares as there is an option to do that convertible bonds pay a lower rate of interest so they are offering you that you can take the bond but you can later convert it into shares what is in it for them they offer you lesser interest on it so the first statement is correct the option to convert to equity affords the bond holder a degree of indexation to rising consumer prices is it inflation adjustment no you only have the option of converting your bonds to shares what if the company performs poorly even if there is high inflation you are not going to get much out of it so it doesn't provide any indexation that happens so one only is the answer 85 this is 2021 indian government bond yields are influenced by which of the following bond yield simply think of it as interest rates interest rates are influenced by what actions of us federal reserve federal reserve increases the rates Uh, capital flight may happen to prevent it indian bonds also government bonds also have to increase so actions of federal reserve can have a role actions of rbi rbi's monetary policy can impact the general interest rates in the economy so bond yields can also get affected inflation how do you even decide what is the yield to be provided based on the inflation and the interest rates that are there in the economy so all three are factors you don't need to know the technical term of yield yield means interest earning that's all that you need to know so all three are factors which could influence okay so that is 85 moving to 86 the penalty made question with reference to india consider the following statements retail investors through dmat account can invest in treasury bills and government of india debt bonds in primary market this was introduced in 2021 2021 retail investors i had mentioned this earlier in a question where household savings are in the form of uh, uh, government uh, no um government borrowings there i had mentioned this retail investors are allowed to through their dm account invest in t bills g uh, g6 and all those things in the primary market uh, your core, core banking you to bear portal so the first statement is correct the negotiated dealing system order matching so nds om is a uh, government securities trading platform of the reserve bank of india you should know this to answer this otherwise you won't be able to the Uh, central deposit services limited is jointly promoted by the reserve bank of india and uh, bombay stock exchange okay so again this is a question where the first one you can know you should be knowing so if you know that the first one is correct and you should be knowing at least that second and third you can leave it at that so if you know the first one is right you know that the C and D is wrong, which means that you don't have to worry about it. There is something wrong with the third statement. You can leave it at that. You don't need to know what is wrong. So one, one and two. So two, you have to make a guess. In this case, two happens to be correct. So it is one of the places where securities are traded. They have given a list. So this is one of the places where it can be traded. So eighty six, you can eliminate, but you cannot exactly arrive at the answer. So eighty six B. Last question. with reference to the indian economy consider the following uh, statements cp commercial paper is a short term unsecured promissory note so who issues cp a cp a corporate it is similar to t bill t bill is issued by the government cp is issued by um, the uh, a corporate need not be private but a corporate issues so it is short term if they issue long term it's corporate bonds so this is short term so that's correct first statement is correct okay second cd is a long term instrument issued by rbi to a corporation two errors there certificate of deposit is not long term it is short term again very similar to cp and these are not issued by rbi it is issued by banks to businesses to invest 
in 5 lakhs or multiples of 5 lakhs for duration of 7 to 365 days. So multiple errors there. If you know about this instrument, you will be able to answer. Call money is a short term finance used for interbank transactions, one day transactions. That is correct. So this statement is correct. This statement is correct. Zero coupon bonds are interest bearing. Look at the error there. I told you in a previous question, coupon means interest. Here it says zero coupon. Here it says interest bearing. How can zero coupon or zero interest bonds be interest bearing bonds? I told you earlier about a concept called as issued at discount, redeemed at par. T bills, 1000 rupees. You pay 950 for it, you can get back 1000. There is an earning out of it, but there is no rate of interest that is associated with it. Those are called as zero coupon bonds. Zero coupon bonds are non interest bearing short term bonds. It could be issued by any entity, scheduled commercial banks. I don't see how they are issuing it. Uh, maybe in the form of CD. Um, not sure. Uh, but uh, CPs can be like that. T bills are, CMBs are like that. So, anyway, fourth statement is wrong. Second statement is wrong. One and three only is the correct answer. Okay. So, this brings to an end the discussion that we have been having on um, the core economics questions during the last seven years, 2016 to uh, 22. Okay. Whatever I have told as patterns, they are not set in stone. The pattern could change any time. What we are observing is that the UPC, based on what is currently happening in the economy, decides what is the area of interest and importance for them. Every single area is equally important. Financial markets is also an area which is gaining prominence, especially over the years. Look at this, 2020, 21, 21, 22, 22. So 22, two questions, 21, two questions, 21 question. Prior to that, 16 to 19, no question at all. So that's an area which is conventionally not important. But here also, here these days, we are getting uh, questions from that area also. So nothing can be predicted. Every single area is, uh, is of importance, more so external sector than any other area. But you cannot just go with that because there are years when external sector has not got any question or just one question alone. Okay, so every area is becoming important or is important. It will vary from year to year. These basic concepts, all of these basic concepts are very, very important. Okay, I hope this discussion, quite a lengthy discussion, which most likely will be broken into parts and uploaded, has been useful for you. Um, if there is any other queries that you have, do reach out in the form of probably comments. So we'll find a way to respond to that as well. Uh, thank you so much. See you in some other video in future or in the classroom.